Peace, love, and honor from True Light Ministries. In our channel, A Light to the Lost Sheep of Israel, I am Minister Makadai Israel, coming to you again with another study, Eggshells, Emotions, and Folly, the Non-Unification of Israel. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to make this really short this week, this opening monologue. I just basically wanted to uh, give you a warning that a lot of the video um, visual was corrupted. Um, it was going in and out, in and out, in and out. So, And the audio was a little choppy here and there. So what I did was I just fused the uh, clubhouse audio onto the video. And um, you know some parts of the video may go in and out, but... The uh, message is intact because of the audio off of Clubhouse. And here's a reminder, anyone who is interested in hearing the uh, live Shabbat studies, uh, we usually go on sometime between 11.30, uh, 12 o'clock on Clubhouse. Um, same uh, name as the YouTube channel, A Light to the Lost Sheep of Israel. You can find us on Clubhouse and uh, come and uh, join the discussion because after the uh, Shabbat study. We usually open the stage for uh, discussion, and we've had we've been having some pretty good discussions lately. So, without further ado, uh, let's get into this. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Shalom, 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 and welcome to another week of a light to the lost sheep of Israel. I am your brother Makadai Israel. And, uh, of course, we took a week off to observe uh, this year's Passover and to have some celebration of our own at home with me and my family. And uh, just to get ready for, you know, what's coming our way to sit back and reflect on the times that are headed our way. And as I predicted um, several weeks ago, after this, I'm going to start going hot and heavy on what's really going on in the world. And we're going to start addressing this right here. All right. For y'all that's um, on Clubhouse, I have a book. It's called COVID-19 and the Great Reset. So we're not going to really get into this today. But what we do need to do is start to address one of the barriers that's going to be a problem with our unification in Israel as we get ready for the Great Reset or what's called Agenda 21 or also agenda 2030 all right so with that said let's get all praise and honor to the almighty yahweh elohim of the heavens and the earth in the name of his only begotten son yeshua hamashiach the light of the world and our soon coming king redeemer and deliverer hallelujah if this is your first time visiting us on youtube please like this content please share and most definitely, please subscribe. Um, to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, I've been contemplating lately on basically restarting my YouTube page because I know I have been shadow banned and YouTube has been blocking a lot of my subscribers, a lot of our content from being seen because they had uh, froze our account before. They um, gave us strikes and warnings and all kinds of stuff because of the content that we preach in this truth you know the uh, enemy doesn't want this content to come out so but for right now i'll keep the youtube page as it is um i haven't been getting no uh not too many new subscribers we got one the other day but i've literally had subscribers tell me they subscribed to our youtube page and it simply did not show up so uh this is how the enemy operates um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to actually be talking about eggshells, emotions, and folly, the non-unification of Israel, all right? And before we um, start to get into that, I want to do an um, opening scripture. It's right here in the book of 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 14. But before I read this, let me tell you why I wanted to go into this. Now, here we are. We're coming off of the feast days. This is one of the most uh, segregated times of the year. Now, if we go into the scriptures, you know, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, was not designed to be separate. 
you know, these feast days and these holy, holy gatherings and festivals were designed for us as Israel to come together and partake together, to bring our offerings to the temple, to be offered up to our king, our creator, our father, Yahweh. All right. But now here we are scattered in all of the earth. And that's fine that we're scattered, you know, in a general sense, because what we do need to be mindful of is we all need to get on one accord. And what I'm pointing out is the feast days is a marker. The feast days is a is a big example on how we are not unified and why this is a trumpet call from your brother, Macadot, that we need to stop playing around and we need to come together because now we're entering into an age and a stage of our life where it's not going to be a game anymore. These people are really planning to bring something very horrible against us. The Bible calls it Jacob's trouble. Yes, Jacob's trouble has already begun. But now with this Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, they are ramping up and they're not playing around. All right. So, you know, you had some people celebrate the feast days last month. You had us that celebrate this month. And you got people arguing and bickering about it. But this is not the time to argue and bicker because ultimately no one can keep the feast days according to the Bible because we're not in the land. We don't have the temple. We don't have the Levites. All right. We don't have a high priest physically on the land to even atone for the people for uh, the day of atonement. Yeshua HaMashiach is our high priest. He already gave his sacrifice for us. So he is the one that makes intercession for us. But while we're here, we have to be reminded again that we are scattered. And the Bible says that you have to make sure that there is no leaven found in all your coasts. All right. So we do it the best that we can as we are scattered in the in individual states that we in. Some, you know, camps and organization and uh, different churches and assemblies celebrated together. And that's that's fine. That's perfect. But we have to have a mind of unification to come together to keep this. Remember, the master said that he would not raise his cup again until we do it all together in the kingdom. And that is the mind that we have to have. We have to have a mind to want to do this together and stop all this fighting and this uh, bickering. You know, we can't even talk to our brothers and sisters today without having to walk on eggshells and worry about their emotions. And how they are going to react by you giving them simply the truth of what the Bible says and what thus saith Yahweh. We are in a very, very reduced state right now. Back in the uh, 60s and the 70s, even in some of the uh, 50s, you know, especially when the uh, civil rights era hit the scene. Our people were strong. All right. We were unified. All right. It they wasn't perfect, but they was in a better state than we are now. And now. Here we are in today's time with all this new technology. And, and, and what I mean by technology is the means for us to be able to reach out and talk to one another. Just like that. We have uh, digital phones where we can actually sit there and see each other while we're talking. And yet, even with all these things that we have today, we are less unified than ever. That is a problem in uh, Israel. That is a problem in the black and brown community that is a problem with people all over the world and, and even with the gentiles it's a problem because even if you are a gentile that's looking for unification with Israel you have to be a part of this as well we are in a reduced state brothers and sisters and that is what we're going to get into today and we're going to get to the uh, root of this and I'm going to pose some solution a lot of it will fall on deaf ears a lot of it may be heard but one way or another, we know that we are all awaiting the second coming of the Mashiach to bring us to the kingdom. All right. We're not waiting to go into the land by ourselves. We're waiting to be saved from the conditions that we're in and the conditions that this one world government is bringing against us. That is what we're waiting for. All right. So with that said, brothers and sisters, let's go ahead and begin right here. As I said, 
First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11 reads, we got to give all honor to the almighty king of Israel, Yahweh. And it reads, thine, O Yahweh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory. Just like the song I was just playing by Todd uh, Dulaney, you know, the anthem. We had to give him the victory because, you know, he came in the flesh. His word came in the flesh and gave up his blood for us so that we could have the victory and the majesty. For all that is in, he in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and thou art exalted as head above all. Now, if Yahweh is our head and he's created us to live in harmony, to be one with one another. You know, when Adam was uh, created, he was, he was created a helper, his wife, right? And Yahweh told them to be one. This is how he want all of us to be as the body of Yahshua. He wants us to be one and he is the uh, head over all. And his son is next in line as our master. And then we as the body have to understand that our number one job is to unite and be one as in one like mind operating together for the uh, goodness of the kingdom to come. All right. Verse 12 reads, both riches and honor come of thee and thou reignest over all and in thine hand is power and might and in thine hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our Elohim, we thank you and praise thy glorious name. And lastly, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort for all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. See, Yahweh created all the heavens and the earth. He gave it to us to have dominion here on earth. And what is it that he would man that he is mindful of us and he gave us all these things. All he wants is our praise. All he wants is our obedience, right? But now, instead of focusing on praise and obedience, we are focused more on arguing, strife, emotions, being mad at one, one another, just simply for, you know, contending with the truth. There's nothing wrong with contending for the truth. You know, it's nothing wrong with, you know, having a, you know, friendly conversation about what thus saith Yahweh. But the problem is when emotions get involved, and you start getting angry with one another and it starts to divide rather than unite. That is the problem. Y'all see me every week now lately. It's just me. You know, we have a, a ministry here. We had we were starting to try to grow our ministry. But now we have to take a back turn because certain individuals, plural, decide they want to leave because I taught on a certain subject and they're not happy about that. All right. I'm being completely honest here. So, hey, if you want to leave because I simply teach you the truth of the Bible, then it's, it wasn't in you in the first place. All right. And what we need is more sincere hearts. And we're going to get into that sincerity today. One other support in scripture. Let's go to Job chapter uh, 41. I got it right here. Job 41. Verse 11 reads, Who has perverted me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. This we have to be reminded of, brothers and sisters, because Yahweh, again, has created everything that we see, even your mama, your daddy, your uncles, your aunt, everything that you see belongs to Yahweh. And everything that belongs to him should be glorifying him rather than separating because of emotions. All right. I just wanted to make this opening scripture plain and simple, especially for those who are new, new to the truth. That when you come into this truth, you shouldn't have such a spirit to want to, you know, uh, just debate all the time. You know what I mean? Have a spirit on you to just want to serve the almighty and his son. And then you serve him by learning as much as you can possibly learn before you dare to go out and teach. Because one thing about teaching, 
we have to be reminded, brothers and sisters, that if you take on this mantle of te of teaching, just like the uh, the apostle, uh, I think it was Apostle James said, that teachers will have the greater condemnation because when we are teaching and we're trying to bring people to this truth and edify each other in this truth, if we stumble and that blood uh, uh, falls because of it, it could be on your hands. All right. This is how serious this is. That's why when you teach, you got to make sure that everything that you teach is right. You have to make sure of it because there's a lot of people out here teaching pseudo scholarship to our people on things that's just simply not true. And today I'm going to give a couple examples, but I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 16 through 22. Hebrews 10. Starting at verse 16. And it reads. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So this is a um, supporting scripture right here of Hebrews chapter 8. And eight, which is actually coming from Jeremiah 31 on the new covenant. But that's not why I wanted to go to this. Let's continue to read on. And their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. Having therefore, brethren, be boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yahshua. By a new and living way which we, excuse me, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of Yahweh, the house of Elohim, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hallelujah. This is what it's all about, brothers and sisters. We have to draw near Yahweh with a sincere heart. That's what that means. A heart in full assurance of faith. We have to be really sincere when it comes to this faith. And now, more than ever, every last teacher out there, there's nothing wrong with teaching about, uh, you know, the Gentiles and bringing them to the truth like we all do. I teach that too. There's nothing wrong with you know, teaching uh, some of the stuff that we see out there about, you know, um, give me an example, teaching about uh, Jacob versus Esau and all that, even though that Jacob versus Esau debate is so old and tired, my recommendation would be, you know, let's stop, keep, you know, we keep arguing over the same things over and over and over. Now, my point is we have to preach faith because where we at in the timeline, in the prophetic timeline, everybody's faith has to be so strong because when this beast system is fully up and running, if your faith is not strong enough, you're just going to simply turn back and go back into the world. This is what we have to be sounding right now. Your faith has to be uh, so strong that not even, you know, a diamond can cut that. And y'all understand that a diamond is one of the hardest substances on the earth. You know, when they when they cut glass, they use diamonds. All right. Diamonds are very hard. And that's how hard and strong our faith has to be. And all for all the newcomers, the way that you create and um, increase your faith is by hearing the word, staying in this word, hearing it, hearing it, hearing it, reading it, reading it, reading it, studying, studying, studying. All right. That's how you do that. So. With that said, let's move on. Let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 25. And I, and I noticed here on uh, Clubhouse that they changed some things up. So uh, I think what we got to do is they, they changed the um, clubs to houses. I wasn't a, aware of that. So um, now what we got to do is now we have to um, invite more people to the house so we can have a bigger turnout. But, um, you know, if y'all like what y'all hear so far, please kindly share this on Clubhouse so we can get more people in here. And then, of course, on our YouTube, you know, you can also share 
this as well. All right, so we'll be in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. And I'm going to start right here at verse 1. And it reads, And Yisrael abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Yisrael joined himself unto Baal Peor. Hold on, my dad gonna watch going on. Sorry about that. And Yisrael joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Yisrael. Baal Peor was a um an idol god of the opening. You know, they got involved with all that sexual immorality and all that stuff because that was like a perversion type of thing with uh, Baal Peor. And Yahweh said unto Moses, this is verse 4, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yahweh against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yahweh may be turned away from Israel. Yahweh was mad. When it comes to sexual immorality and homosexuality and adultery and all that stuff Yahweh does not like it all right so uh some people say well what kind of God is this this is a fierce God you know and I'm gonna I'm I'm go into a um a small testimony after this let's go ahead and continue numbers 25 and 5 and Moses said unto the judges of Israel slay ye every one his man that were joined unto Baal Peor this is how you purge sin out of the nation brothers and sisters all right. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren uh, uh, a Midianish uh, woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the high priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So now, this is the problem in Israel. Sometimes, you know, people read this and they'll be like, well, this was, this was brutal. Why would this, you know, priest go and kill these people? What kind of God would allow his priests to kill innocent people? Well, first off, they wasn't innocent. All right. Now, when you read the context of this, you see that these um, women of Moab, they were, you know, bringing out men of Israel to their gods. And see, that's why Yahweh always warned us about foreign women. It's OK to marry foreign women, but they have to be clean. They have to serve him. You know, but if you are trying to get foreign wives or foreign husbands and they don't serve Yahweh, that's where the problem lies. All right. There's nothing wrong with marrying somebody from another nation. There's nothing wrong with that at, at all, because that's what it was about. It was about nations. It wasn't about ethnicity. It wasn't about skin tone. It wasn't nothing, nothing like that. It was about nation. All right. Because let's say if I wasn't married, right? And I was looking for a wife and I went over to China to find a wife. There are black people in China as me being a black man, you know. So, you know, it's not about, you know, me marrying my race. You know, I serve Yahweh. I'm looking for a woman to serve Yahweh as well. So, you know, even if it was an a, a, a Asian um, Chinese person or a black Chinese person, it doesn't matter if she's not serving Yahweh as well, you know. So that's the point that I'm trying to make. And so this is how you purge that sin out of Israel. And that's what uh, Phineas did. In verse 8 it says, And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, and the man of Israel and the woman through her, her belly, so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Some people say they were actually in the act. Now, I can't read that into the text, but, you know, it is a possibility, you know. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000, right? And then it says, And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. 
Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. And this is the covenant of peace here. Verse 13 says, And he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his Elohim and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Hallelujah. Uh, who is this saying? Somebody wants to talk. Oh, no, I don't want to talk to anybody right now. All right, so right here, uh, Phineas, he, he found favor in the uh, sight of Yahweh. Yahweh was happy with what he did. And as a uh, minister, as a priest, this is how we have to behave ourselves in the sight of Yahweh. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes to purge sin out of our nation and to edify the nation. We got ministers and teachers today that are afraid to teach the people, but that is not the case. Our job as uh, teachers and priests and ministers is to make a peace between Yahweh and the people. That's how you become one. First, you have to make a peace. Shalom. We have to have shalom with one another. You know, if you don't have shalom with your creator, how are you going to become one with him? Because there's a lot of people who are angry at the almighty. You know, some people are angry with the almighty simply because of their conditions. Some people are angry uh, with the almighty because they don't have a lot of uh, material things and, you know, things that they covet. You know, these are these are foolish, you know, reasons to be mad at your creator. You know, a lot of atheists, you know, it stems from their heart as they got some kind of anger towards Yahweh. You know, a lot of them know that he exists. But it's because of their anger that's on their heart that they reject him. And they simply just cannot have peace with him because they're upset with him for, for various reasons. So we as ministers and, and um, priests and um, messengers, you know, that is our, our office is to make peace, you know, between the people and the almighty. And, you know, another way of saying that is to bring them to the almighty. You know, this is the age of returning back to Yahweh. You know, a lot of people, you know, wake up to this truth and they're so lost that, you know, it's good to fall upon the um, ears of a good teacher. That way he can direct your path. You know, how are you going to hear this truth without a preacher? You can go and study for yourself, you know, all you want. You know, if you are, you know, inclined academically and really no reading comprehension, you could po possibly really get understanding from studying by yourself. But that wasn't the way that we were designed. We were designed to be under um, a shepherd, under leadership. You know what I'm saying? I'm a minister and I still listen to other teachers. You see what I'm saying? Because I don't know everything. You know, I'm, I'm striving my best, but it's always good even for teachers to listen to other teachers, you know? That's how it was with the uh, that spirit of the seventy elders. You know, they 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 mixed mixed it up with each other. You know, they confided in each other. They you know compared notes with each other. That's how we got to be. So you know, coming off of this scripture, as uh, Phineas, uh, let's go to First uh, Peter chapter two verse nine. Most of us know this scripture by heart, but I want to enter it into the record. Because I want to remind everybody of this. Those and remember, whenever we are teaching, you know, it's for all of the body of Israel. So it's okay to hear it over and over again. So let's read it again. This is first Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light last time i was up we went into that darkness and light you know he called you out of sin into his into the body of yeshua his light you know and like, as he say right here you are a royal priesthood that's every last one of you who convert to israel both man and woman we are all called to be priests of yahweh and bring people to yahweh and and and, and build that bridge of peace between those that are coming out of the world to our Elohim. All right. 
One more I want to go into as far as this subject. Let's go to uh, the uh, Apocrypha. Let's go to the uh, Book of Sirach. Let me put it up on the screen here. We're going to go to the Book of Sirach and the Apocrypha, uh, chapter 7. And uh, I'm going to read, I'm going to start at verse 29 through 31, and then I'm going to skip down to 36. 29 reads, Fear Yahweh with all thy soul, and reverence his priests. This is to the whole body of Yahshua, the nation of Israel. You know, have that respect and that fear of Yahweh. And you have to also have respect for his priests. Love him that made thee with all thy strength, and forsake not his ministers. All right. This is very important. Quick testimony, brothers and sisters. Uh, I've been uh, a minister now for almost two years, uh, unofficially first. And then I recently got officially ordained this year. All right. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I got to be honest with you. Even before I became a minister, I was already teaching the word. However, I started to get serious about it two years ago. Um, one thing that I have noticed is ever since I officially has gotten ordained, I have received so much disrespect from Israel. It's not even funny. All right. A lot of it is simply because people get into their feelings. Keep people have emotions. They don't want to be edified the correct way. And it's sort of like a pride thing with a lot of people. I'm not saying all because a lot of people listen to me. A lot of people listen to my counsel that I have to offer as being a minister for Yahweh. But there are some people that simply do not care and simply do not respect the office of the, minister, the ministers of Yahshua. All right. Verse 31 says, fear Yahweh and honor the priest and give him his portion as it is commanded thee, the first fruits and the trespass offering, and the gift of the shoulders, and the sacrifice of the sanctification, and the first fruits of the holy things. Now, here we are, yeah, we know a lot of these we can't do because the temple isn't there. But we can still give the priests and the ministers there, and, and teachers as well, we can give them all their portion, you know? And the way you give them their portion is by having that respect for them as men and women of the cloth. Have that respect for them as knowing that they are serving Yahweh and they're doing and most of us. I can't speak for every last one of us, but most of us are serving Yahweh because we we just sincerely love Yahweh and we love his people. All right. I don't have anything to gain out of this personally, you know. I, you don't think that I contemplated that scripture that we're going to get the greatest condemnation? I have contemplated that. But at the end of the day, I can't let that deter me from trying my best to be there for the people and bring us all on one accord. Lastly, verse 36. Whatsoever thou takest in hand, remember the end, and thou shalt never do amiss, or you should never sin. All right, let's read this in another um, translation. One second, let me uh, pull up which translation I want to go into. The DRB translation. All right, DRB is the uh, Douay Reims Bible. And it says, In all thy works, remember thy last end. So in all your works, remember to what you are striving for. Yeshua said, he or she that endures to the end shall be saved. That is our whole goal is to endure to the end, right? Our whole goal. And then, you know, the summation of the whole matter is to keep the commandments and continue in faith so that we can make it to the end. And if we keep this in mind, like the scripture says, if we remember our last end and remember that we're simply striving to make it into the kingdom of Yahweh, then we shall never sin. All right. Will you make a mistake? Maybe. But with this type of mindset, you'll never sin because you know that you're trying to get into the kingdom. 
All right, let's go ahead and move this along. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move this along and uh, let's go to Jeremiah chapter six. Let me go to Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, chapter six. All right, let me change this um, back to KJV too. Jeremiah chapter six, and we're gonna be reading verses 10 to 14. And it reads, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of Yahweh is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. See, a lot of times, even with people who claim to be awoke, a lot of times you give them these warnings from the Bible, not of your own understanding. All right. Nothing that I ever warn people of is from my understanding. I didn't write the Bible, but when we do it, sometimes they get in their feelings, you know, and so you got to kind of like tiptoe around their emotions because ultimately you don't want to lose a soul, you know, when you're trying to witness to people, but their ears are so uncircumcised. A lot of times they don't want to hear it. You know, this is especially the case with um, Sunday Christians, you know, because they all claim to have you know, righteousness. But when you start really breaking down what we really supposed to do, they turn, they turn them ears and they close them tight. They don't want to hear it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, verse 11. Therefore, I am full of the fury of Yahweh. I am weary with holding it. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. But even the husband with the wife shall be taken. The aged with him that is full of days. Now, this is going into um, Jeremiah prophesizing to Judah on what will happen if you don't turn to Yahweh in these days. This is what's going to end up happening. And we all know this actually did happen. This is a fulfilled prophecy right here. These are chapters leading up to the Babylonian captivity. And uh, we can also apply that to our days here as well, because, you know, a lot of our people closing their ears. You don't want to hear this. You know, we'll all be taken, the husband with the wife. But now, as I showed y'all the book, The Great Reset, you're going to be taken in a different way. You're going to think that you are in paradise because that's how they're going to try to make this society so wonderful. You know, you, you are not going to want to go into the wilderness. But ultimately, that's what we're going to have to do. And that's what I'm going to be preaching on in the next few weeks on our need to detach from this, this system and go into off-grid living, all right? That is what the covenant is Yahweh made with the wilderness. He made a wilderness for the beasts of the field not to bother us when we go off-grid. Why would he make that covenant if that's not where we are supposed to go? Now, all you brothers and sisters out there that's preaching, oh, we must leave America and go only to Africa, that's simply not true, all right? That's simply not true. Now, I had an argument that I believe that if you went to Africa, that going into the wilderness in Africa could be very beneficial for a lot of people. But the truth of the matter is everybody can't make it there. So what about the ones who can't make it there? We still have to be for, for them as well. We can't just turn our backs on our family. Didn't Yahshua say when they said, behold, thy mother, thy father. No, excuse me. Behold, thy mother, thy, thy brother, your sisters. And Yeshua looked at them and said, no, nah, you know, behold my brothers and, and my mother here. That is those that do the will of the father. All of those that are striving for the kingdom with me. This is my family. All right. And I'm paraphrasing. This is my family. So if you are my family striving for the kingdom like I am, who am I to turn my back on you? We, are, we have to do this together. This is the unification that we need. All of us should all be coming together with our minds. We should be having meetings on how we're going to raise our vegetable beds. How are we going to grow our uh, vegetables? How are we going to grow our, our grains and stuff like that? Because according to prophecy, we got to be out there for three and a half years off grid. And some people are going to be making to the end of that three and a half years going to give up before they see Yahshua return. This is what we got to uh, get people ready for. All right, what verse was I on? I was on uh, verse 12, all right? And it reads, 
and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, says Yahweh. For from the least of them into, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet even unto the priest, everyone deals falsely. And that's what we're dealing with today. Our brothers and sisters that's in the uh, Sunday churches, are you preparing your congregation to, to detach from the beast system? Are you teaching them the prophecies of everything that's coming our way? Now, I ain't going to just pick on y'all. A lot of y'all camps and stuff like that. Are y'all preparing your congregation for the, for the wilderness? I don't know anything about farming, but this is what we got to learn. We got to learn how to grow this stuff. Because what was that uh, recently in the news? They just had a um, factory with um, all those cows and stuff that just got destroyed. You see that? It was just on the news. I forget how many thousands. It, it was like tens of thousands of uh, cows. Anybody in the audience seen that uh, news update with that factory that burned to the ground? And you, and you could hear all the uh, cows in there screaming and, and uh, whelping for help. They're destroying all of these food factories and stuff because ultimately what's going to happen. Bill Gates bought all these uh, acres of land in the West. They're going to raise their own um, cattle and they're going to want us to uh, get out of uh, our meats and stuff from them. And the only way that you can be sustained with meats from them is if you take that mark of the beast. That's why they did. That's why they're trying. That's why you're seeing all this stuff in the um, in the media with, uh, you know, up in Ohio with, with them destroying the uh, water and contaminating the water system. You're seeing all these derailments and everything's happening, you know, in these last days, you know, um, different uh, 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 truck tankers and stuff like that exploding and putting these poisonous gases into the air and stuff like that. All of this stuff isn't coincidence. And all while all this is happening, the non-unification of Israel is continually growing. If anything, all of this stuff should be alerting us and, and, and reminding us that we have to unite. You know? How are we going to make it through if we're not one? You know, this, this beast has taught us individualism. It taught us individualism because it destroyed the civil rights movement. It started to teach our women, you know, that feminist movement to be separate. You don't need a man. You know, but if you're a woman in these last days, can you imagine having to live off grid by yourself? How are you going to make it without a man? And vice versa. As a man, how are you going to make it without your woman? We was designed to help each other and make it through together. But now we have all this individualism, you know. If I go to a, uh, let's, let's just use one of the camps, for example. If I go to one of the camps, I'm walking in here in Baltimore. We got a lot of camps here. There's a few, um, holy name uh assemblies here but for the most part in baltimore maryland we have um camps so if i go up to a camp and i start contending with the faith they'll treat me as an outsider whereas if i'm coming to you you're supposed to be my brother if we are both israel you're supposed to treat me the same way you treat that brother standing right there next to you but they don't do that because it's that we've been taught all this individualism and the separate and the separateness. And then you talk to a camp brother and you start hitting them with the scriptures on some stuff that they that, that goes outside of their preset package. Oh, they get mad. Oh, they get in their emotions then. Especially if you if you catch them, they start lying, they start tap dancing. Man, you know, this is a, a testimony on how cunning the devil is. He's told them to reject the uh, baptism of repentance. He's taught them to say, okay, you, you form your, your congregation. You, you can go ahead and be 501c3. If you 501c3 during the Great Reset, you are in trouble because the government owns your congregation. That's how you get your, all your uh, federal assistance and stuff like that. 
All right, let's go ahead and continue moving on because I don't want to uh, make this too too long. All right, let's go to the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 4 through uh, 11. Jeremiah chapter 8, 4 through 11. All right, so with Jeremiah 8, I'm not going to make this too long, but the reason why I wanted to go to this real quick is because I got into a conversation with a brother on Facebook, and basically he was um, trying to debunk keeping the Passover um, in a sense that we can't keep the Passover since we left the wilderness because um, Yahweh doesn't want us killing uh, defenses of animals and all of the, uh, the laws, statutes, and commandments in the Bible that deals with this, uh, it was written in by um, unrighteous and wicked scribes. And he using this scripture here as a um, reference point. And he went into a lot of other foolishness, but that is the gist of it. All right. Now, we know now that we in the uh, last days here, um, scattered in all the different countries, we can't sacrifice lamb anyway for Passover. But, you know, you cook lamb or whatever and you have it. All we're doing is remembering because we know ultimately Yahshua is our Passover lamb. All right. So, no, we can't sacrifice. We don't have the temple. We don't have the priesthood and all that. But we're remembering. But that wasn't what the argument he was making. His argument is since we left Egypt, you cannot sacrifice a Passover. And that is simply not true. So let's get into this testimony and see where he's wrong. Me and Sister Deborah, shout out to Sister Deborah, Sister Kim, everybody in the audience. Thank you for coming through. We already discussed this and, and <laughs> it wasn't even worth anybody's time. They ain't pay attention to that guy. But this particular scripture got under my skin because this is the pseudo scholarship that we have to contend with. Verse four reads, moreover, thou shalt say unto them, to who? The tribe of Judah. This is who Jeremiah is prophesizing to. And yes, it could be for the whole uh, nation of Israel. But at this particular time, Judah is the one prophesied to go into captivity in Babylon. All right. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, thus saith Yahweh, shall they fall and not rise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is the people of Jerusalem slitten back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast the seat. They refuse to return. The prophets are blowing this show far. Like, yo, yo, this, this Babylon is about to come against y'all. You need to turn back to the Almighty before it's too late. But did they listen? We all know they didn't listen. Verse 6 says, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes into the battle. Yea, the stork in the heaven knows her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of Yahweh. Look, this is this is all prophetic talk. This is all symbolism here. You know, the turtle and the crane and the swallow, all of them know what to do. But why does our people, why does the tribe of Judah, Israel, why do you not know that the judgment of Yahweh is going to come if you don't repent? That's what is he, that's basically what he's saying here. So it reads, how do you say we are wise and the law of Yahweh is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. This is the verse right here that the gentleman tried to say, that because of this verse, scribes in Israel wrote in the law that, you know, you can continue on having the Passover, like with the uh, third Passover with Joshua um, and, and all the other Passovers that we had. He's basically saying that the scribes wrote that in in vain. No, that's not what this means, brother. This says, how do you say we are wise? If you are Israel and you haven't even turned back from repenting, how are you going to even boast? A lot of our brothers and sisters try to contend with you and debate and, and do it with strife and anger on your heart. How are you going to cause yourself wise and you can't even get that anger off your heart, which is a sin, right? 
And the and how are you gonna say that the law of Yahweh is with you? Lo, certainly, in vain may he it. Because you've refused to repent, because you refuse to turn to Yahweh, then obviously Yahweh made it for nothing because you ain't listening to it. The pen of the scribes are in vain. The, the pens of the scribes is what writ, wrote the uh, scriptures. You know, over time when they're copying the scriptures, they write it down. They're very careful with how they write the, um, the scriptures. That's what he's saying. He's saying the pens of the scribe wrote all of this stuff down for nothing because you refuse to repent. This is what we all got to deal with out there with our brothers and sisters in Israel. They refuse to repent. They refuse to see the scriptures, what they're literally saying, and and what they're saying morally, what they're saying, uh, what's that other word, anagogically, and what is, well, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, that, that we're learning in the Bible today, you know, a lot of people returning to the Bible, you know, for the first time, we are behind. A lot of us are behind, and we're trying to catch up, and so, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are waking up to this truth. You know, trying to understand the literal um, meaning of, of the Bible and the moral and all the other stuff I mentioned. But, you know, they're not taking the, the, the time to actually just learn before they go out and try to contend for the faith and teach people. You know what I'm saying? Let's go ahead and finish this. So it says, therefore, will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For everyone from the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, everyone deals falsely. See, this verse right here even testifies to what I'm saying. Because y'all continue to deal falsely, I'm going to bring the curses of Deuteronomy 28 on you. I'm going to give your wives to others. Didn't he already promise that years and years ago before Jeremiah came on the scene? So this is showing you that, yeah, because you turned away now, the curses are going to be put on you. And I'm going to give your wives to others. And their fields to them that shall inherit them. Right? Didn't Yahweh say that we would have um, fields and we would build, build property and all that? And other people going to enjoy it if we turn away from his law? Verse 13, excuse me, verse 11 says, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Shalom, Shalom, when there is no peace. Today, when we are contending with these people, a lot of times, you know, you say shalom to them. They won't even say it back. But then they're getting their feelings. The ones that will say it back, they'll get in that feeling. But they, you, you, you can tell they don't really mean it, you know, but they still have a fear for Yahweh. The true thing to do is just repent of all that wickedness and just learn. You know what I mean? Just learn. You know, we all know what, uh, what, what shalom means. So what I'm going to do is real briefly, just to remind, let me go to uh, my blue letter Bible real quick and I'm going to pull up what it says for Shalom in the blue letter Bible. All right. Let's see. Here we go. Let me go to the Entelier where the word Shalom is in the Strong's H7965. And this is what is it, this is what it says for Shalom. Shalom means completeness soundness welfare peace so when we are dwelling in shalom we are one we are complete we are sound right it also says completeness in number safety soundness body welfare health prosperity peace quiet tranquility contentment peace friendship of human relations with god especially in covenant relationship remember when i mentioned the um, covenant of the wilderness Right. We got to be one with Yahweh when we go out in that, that covenant, uh, when we enter the covenant uh, of the wilderness. Peace from war, peace as objective. All right. So the root word for this is Shalom. That's S-H-A-L-A-M. And it's a verb and it's in the Strong's um, Hebrew portion where it says um, it's H7999. And shalom, the root word says the same thing to be in a covenant of peace, be at peace. So when you are contending with somebody and they get angry with you because you cut them with the scriptures, how are they going to tell you um, shalom and we not even on the same accord? 
I cut these brothers up uh, so bad with the scriptures up. You know, it starts to get down to, well, let's just agree to disagree. No, I don't, I don't agree to disagree. No, you can agree to disagree. But no, you need to humble yourself and repent and admit that you were just simply wrong. And a lot of our brothers and sisters cannot do that because of the pride that's on their heart and the uh, emotions and, and all of this stuff that's inside of them. You know, you want true peace. You have to repent of that stuff. Furthermore, it says to be at peace, peaceful um, one, one in covenant of peace to make peace with, to cause to be peace at. And, and, and it, it all saying the same thing. Um, one other thing that I will point out that Shalom makes that's different from Shalom is that it used the word also to restore and to amend. And that's what it means to uh, repent and turn from, you know, darkness. You are amending and you are repairing your heart because you're turning from that previous sin to Yahweh's truth. All right. So let's go ahead and continue this on. All right. Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter two. In the book of Ephesians chapter two, verses 11 through 17 reads, wherefore, remember, this is um, about being one in the Mashiach. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without the Mashiach. So, yes, this the uh, church at, at um, Ephesus, that was a Gentile church. But also this can go for um, blood Israelites, too, who were departed from the covenant. All right. Because if you are without Christ, then you are an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. That's what this says right here in verse 12. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. It doesn't matter if you are a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're from one of the nations. It doesn't matter if you think you are a blood Israelite. If you are without Yeshua HaMashiach, you are an alien from the commonwealth. You are a stranger from the covenants of promise. And you have no hope unless you repent and turn to the almighty king of Israel and repent of your ways. All right. Verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus... You who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of the Mashiach. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that's the hatred, right? Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Let's stop here for a second. Because now the Christian... Um, Followers will say, oh, see right here, the laws of Yahweh are done away with. No, that's not what this is saying. Let's go ahead and finish it. It says, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The best way for me to show you, let's go to another um, translation. Let's go so I can show you this. All right. Let's go to the Sefer Bible. It says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, again, that's the hatred, the commands of the statutes contained in dogma to make in himself of two, one new man, so make peace. A lot of that dogma came from the Pharisees. That's what uh, Elder Paul is talking about because the Pharisees had their own set of oral traditions and laws and statutes that they wanted Israel and you know, people outside of Israel to um, respect, you know, um, they wanted the Gentiles to respect the fact that they believe that uh, Jews could not mingle with them. All right. So this is the uh, this was causing like a hatred between Israel and the Gentiles. That is what this is talking about. This is not talking about people actually hating Yahweh's commandments. This is the, uh, the uh, commandments contained in the dogma of the Pharisees. All right. So let's continue on. Uh, verse 16 and 17 read, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross or by the torture stake, for those who don't like the word cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them 
that were near. That is the whole uh, thing of what I was trying to say. It's the peace. It's the shalom that brings us together. When we have shalom with one another, then we can be one with one another. And we can abolish the hatred between uh, so-called Israelites and the Gentiles. And we can all just come together as one. That is a very, very big problem because, as I mentioned, um, with the Great Reset, I'm seeing that our timeline is 2030. We don't have a lot of time to bridge this gap between those that are standing now and the Gentiles. You know, um, we, we need to continue on preaching this because our brothers and sisters got to understand that if you do not make amends with loving the Gentiles as your brothers and sisters, that's going to be a very, very serious thing when the son of man comes on the scene you know we have to make peace you we have to have peace in this uh walk of righteousness if not then we're simply not his and that's what it is a lot of people are pretending to be his and they're not let's go to the book of jeremiah chapter 30 book of jeremiah chapter 31 verse here says in um 30 and 7 alas for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Um, again, this is a testimony to when we go into the wilderness, Yahweh makes that covenant in the wilderness. He has a promise also that he is going to gather us all from all the countries that we are scattered. And what he and if you combine it all together, that means that he's going to combine. He is going to gather us up out of all the wildernesses wherever we at in these countries, and then he's going to bring us down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, right? And he's going to plead with us, and he's going to purge out the rebels, right? And bring us under the bond of the covenant. That is what that says. In the meantime, he's saying, "Alas, this is a warning right here. That day is great." That day of Jacob's trouble is nothing going to be like it. I had a brother that told me that the transatlantic slave trade is worse than this. How is this transatlantic slave trade going to be worse than Jacob's trouble? And if you don't work, make it out of Jacob's trouble, you could lose your salvation. Yes, and the transatlantic slave trade, our ancestors was under chattel slavery. Yes, it was horrible. A lot of horrible things happened. Children was uh, fed as alligator bait. They were cutting babies out of mothers' um, bellies. They were castrating some of the men, raping some of the men and women. You know, it was all kinds of horrible things going on. But the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be so much worse than that. Because not only are they going to be seeking to kill you, you're not going to have the resources that you have now. See, in transatlantic slave trade, yes, they was in chattel slavery, but... The slave masters provided for their um, for their property, even though it was rags and, you know, they ate the, uh, the scraps. We all know they was feeding them uh, scraps of the pig and, you know, unclean animals and all that. But if you're not a hunter, if you don't know how to fish, you don't know how to do nothing. This um, this 2030 come upon us and you got to go out there in the wilderness. How are you going to survive? And you have no survival skills. This is why I'm sounding an alarm and saying this is why we need to unify and we need to start preparing. They have a lot of brothers in Israel that um, have channels and um, have websites and stuff about kingdom preppers. These are kingdom preppers. They are prepping for the, the kingdom. I got a brother on my Facebook page and all he does all week long, he got a couple things. He, he, he'll mix it up a little bit, but some of his main things that he put on his, his page is um, prepping things, uh, you know, nice... Um, Nicely priced things that you can buy for prepping, you know, no matter if it's like a tent or, you know, uh, how, how to start a fire without um, knowing how to start it with the, the wood, little kits and stuff like that. He puts that kind of stuff on his uh, Facebook page and he also puts up on his face page um, missing people all the time. And, and this, is, this is like regularly and there's so many people coming up missing and nobody's talking about it. So this is why I'm sounding along. We need to unify so that we can learn how to kingdom prep together and learn how to, you know, uh, you know, pitch, pitch a tent. And, you know, because and when you go into the wilderness, you know, the main things that you got to know how to survive is you got to have water. These are the main elements you got to have. You got to have water. You got to have shelter. 
You got to have fire to be able to uh, start a fire because especially if it's during the winter time, how you going to keep warm? Um, and what else you got to have? Um, water. Or, or you got to have food, of course. And there's a, there's a few other things. And we're going to get into that because I made a note of it. But, you know, when you think about uh, these things, you know, shelter, that's a covering. Water, which gives life, right? Um, food, that's the bread. That's Yahshua. All of these things are attributes of Yahshua. So, yes, you're going to have to have faith. And, and yes, through your faith, Yahshua is going to sustain us. But we also have to have faith enough to know that he's warning us through his word. So we need to be prepping and, and, and getting together all these things now. You know, start off if you have to with a little book bag with, you know, little stuff in there like first aid kits and all kinds of stuff you know, to uh, start building upon. But we got to start somewhere. You know what I mean? Let's go to the book of uh, Romans. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 10. All right. And I'm going to be reading verses 9 to 17. Romans chapter 10. Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong place. All right. I got it. Romans chapter 10, 9 and 17 reads. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that the master Yahshua um, and shalt believe in thine heart that Yahweh has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew or and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they say on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And, sh and, and excuse me. And how shall they hear without a preacher? This is the uh, verse I was alluding to earlier. With a lot of our brothers and sisters first waking up to the truth. A lot of people trying to be in the truth for like three years and go out and start teaching. No, 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 no. First, you need to learn all you need to learn first. And you need to get under a shepherd, a preacher, a teacher. So you can really learn this truth. You know? And, you know, especially with, you know, all of the emotions and, 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 and rebellion that Israel has today. You know, again, my whole thing right now is preparation, is faith, and getting ready for what's, what's coming our way with Jacob's trouble. So if this is what I'm preaching, you need to get under preachers like that because, you know, if you're only under a, a, a preacher that's only preaching uh, prosperity, then he he's preaching the complete opposite of what you need to be doing. Because this prosperity is all going to be taken away from us at one point or another. And the CBDC system, the central bank digital currency system, is going to take over. This July, the FedNow program starts. Don't y'all don't y'all think it's very, very strange that the founder of the Cash App was mysteriously killed when they are about to launch this FedNow um Cash App? That's basically what FedNow is, is a form of Cash App. And on top of it, a lot of um um uh, big big names in the uh, um, world of cryptocurrency and um, some of the other platforms have mysteriously been killed as well. But nobody's talking about that. That's because they plan to, you know, take all the currency and combine it as one. They're going to get rid of cash, which we all see is happening. And that's all a precursor to the mark of the beast. So if we're not ready for this and you are only under a pastor that's preaching prosperity, you are doomed. You're doomed. Because you have no guidance on how to prepare for, you know, the uh, covenant of, in the wilderness. All right. Let's go ahead and finish this. Or right, where was I at? Verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? You got to be sent to teach. You got to be sent to do this. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good tidings. See, we're going back to that word shalom. The word peace. We all got to have peace with each other in order to unite as one. Again, this is the most uh, ununited time in Israel's history. 
is the most ununited time in the black community's history, the black and brown community. We are so divided, you know, and even in the general sense of the Gentiles, you know, if you're a Gentile that's called by the name of Yahweh into this truth, you're not wanting on one accord with your own um, people because you are to detach from them and attach to Israel. So you are supposed to be on one accord with us as well. Right. Verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Master, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Yahweh. As I uh, mentioned earlier, we got to continue to hear this word so we can increase our faith. Because it's only the faith is that's going to sustain us in these last days. Yeshua said that even some of the very elect is going to turn back. From the destruction that's headed our way. That's some of these um, brothers that's up here. The um, big names. Some of them brothers that be having uh, you know, the debates. And be putting the wrestling belts on their shoulder and stuff like that. Thinking they the, they the best debater around. Alright it's good to be a, a debater. But what does that mean for your salvation. When all of this uh, Jacob's trouble is heading our way. That belt ain't that belt not going to save you bro. How you going to get your food? How you going to drink? And, uh, you know, be sustained with all the elements that we mentioned. See, this is the folly in Israel. You know, they want to, uh, you know, boast and, and brag about how good and, you know, all that accolades and stuff like that. All that boasting and bragging ain't going to get you nowhere. That's going to get you killed because while you boasting and bragging about uh, your, your debate on um, who Esau is, you don't even know how to pitch a tent. You ain't even pick a location to go into the wilderness yet. For all we know, Yeshua could be about to crack that sky. Or better yet, for all we know, the mark of the beast could be implemented July 1st when that uh, Fed Now program start. Here they're going to um, launch launch the Fed Now program. And they say, well, you ain't going to be able to use your money unless you put that mark in your hand. Many people think it's the RFID chip. I don't know. It's a good argument for it, but we don't know. We got to see. And that's why Yeshua said, continue to watch and pray. All right. Let's go to the book of uh, Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians, chapter 5. And I'm going to be reading verses 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is what we got to be walking in. If you say you got the Holy Spirit on your heart, the Ruach HaKodesh, then this should be the attributes. This should be the characteristics that you should display at all times. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are the Mashiachs, has crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If you're really Yahshua's, you shouldn't have no lust to do anything wrong. You shouldn't have no lust to be fornicating. You shouldn't have no lust to be uh, shooting up any dope or anything like that. You shouldn't have no, uh, no type of lust to be stealing, coveting things. If you are a true follower of Yeshua, then all that stuff should be gone by now. And if you are in between, if you lukewarm right now, my suggestion is to fully give your life to the Mashiach and follow him and get ready for what's coming our way. All right. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. It's always will remind me of when I used to go to church at Greater Harvest Baptist Church. We'd be in there all day long. You know, everybody's hooting and hollering and stuff like that, catching the Holy Ghost. And as soon as we go home, you know, my mother and my aunts and them arguing with each other and stuff like that. Like, how if, if you got this, uh, the uh, spirit on you, how are you going to be in church all day and then go home and start fighting? I used to think about stuff like that when I was a uh, child. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another and envying one another. You know, sometimes when we having these discussions with brothers and sisters in the truth, I start to feel that from certain people. Start to feel that they're envying me or something like that, only because I'm pointing out something to you that you've never seen in the uh, scriptures before. 
and it's contrary to what you previously be believed. So we walk them down with the questions that we have for them and we're proving to them that, you know, what you previously believe ain't true. They'll still fight you tooth and nail because of that pride and because of that envy. I've had brothers tell me to my face they envied me before, you know, on another subject outside of uh, the righteousness uh, world. I had uh, one of my brothers uh, that I grew up with. He told me to my face that he envied me. He was a Christian. But obviously the true uh, Christian faith wasn't in his heart because he told me two times that he envied me. That was very hurtful. But that's the world we live in today. Let's go ahead and continue on so we can finish this up. And what I'm going to try to do because I got a, I got a testimony um, that I want to add to this of um, somebody saying some crazy stuff to me. When it comes to this truth. I hadn't heard this one before. Y'all going to find this very, very interesting. And maybe some of y'all did hear this before. But before we do that, I want to go into a narrative in the book of Judges, chapter 19. I'm going to try to chop and screw this because I don't want it to be real long. Because the book of Judges, um, 19, 20, and 21 is the narrative. But I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to try to make this as brief as possible. But I want y'all to understand that this is one of the embodiments of how we are today in Israel and why we cannot unify. All right. In this particular narrative, let me get it in on my um my tablet. The book of Judges. All right. Chapter 19, we're gonna start. All right, so in this um narrative, we're gonna start to read about a Levite that's trying to go and save his uh concubine. And doing that, he stumbled upon the land of our uh, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin. You know, they start to do some stuff they wasn't supposed to do according to the law. And it started to get hot and heavy. Let's get into it. And let's, uh, I know a lot of y'all have read this before, but this is very interesting. Let's go ahead and start at the um, chapter 1 and verse 19. I mean, excuse me, chapter um, 19, verse 1. And we're going to go ahead and get into this, in, into this narrative. It reads, And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. That there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of the Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his, con his concubine played the whore against him. That means she cheated on him, right? And she went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. So she went away from him. She walked away from her husband, went and cheated. This is a no-no. This is a this is she she broke a commandment, right? And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. Right. And I had it up on the screen. What? Where did it go at? All right. Let's put it back here. My, my signal is buffering for YouTube. I'm probably going to have to fix this video like I had to do it that one uh, Shabbat. But you know what, brothers and sisters, I, I, you know, coming off the feast days, man, I, I told you I've been getting afflicted and all kinds of stuff. But this happens every Shabbat. You know, that spirit of Shaitan always tries to find a way to foil the plan. But that's OK. We're going to go ahead and continue on with this. All right. So it says in, in verse four and his father-in-law, the Danzel's father, retained him and he abode with him three days so they did eat and drink and lodge there. Did I read verse three? I want to. Did I read verse three? I, I, all right, let me go back to verse three. Sorry about that, y'all. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servants with him and a couple of asses. Yeah, I did read it. And she brought him and into her father's house and went. The father of the damsel saw him. He rejoiced to meet him. All right, so we read four. Let's go ahead and get to go down to five. And it came to pass on the fourth day when they arose early in the morning that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread and afterwards go your way. And he sat down and did eat and drink both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him. Therefore, he lodged there again. 
And he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until afternoon. And they did both eat and drink. So now he uh, is the narrative that he lost his own wife for four months. And he went over, and went back and got her. So now that he got her, let's skip down to verse 14. So we can shorten this up a little bit. Verse 14 says, And they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. That's the tribe of Benjamin. So now, you know, they stayed with the father-in-law for a while, but now they went on their way. And now we see that they're um, leaving and they end up in Gibeah, which belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in a street of the city. But there was no man that took him into his house to lodging. Now, this is not a thing that is customary in the nation of Israel during this time. Because you see a fellow man, you're supposed to help him out, right? Verse 16 says, And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim. And he sojourned in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. So that's what we're reading about. We're reading about this Levite man and how the Benjamites are about to come at him wrong. So let's go down to verse 22. This is where it's going to start getting interesting at. Verse 22 reads, Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, the Benjamites, certain sons of Bilal. All right, we know that means worthlessness, worthless, right? Some of these worthless Benjamites beset the house round about and beat at the door and spoke to the master of the house the old man saying bring forth the man that came into your house that we may know him look how wicked that is brothers and sisters right this is reminding us of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah right but now we see that this is happening in the tribe of Benjamin and for all y'all who don't know that we may know him is a euphemism for so we can have sex with him. That's what that means. All right. So this is um, wickedness because we all know that homosexuality is against the law of Yahweh. All right. Let's further read. And also one other thing I want to make um, is a lot of times in our in our culture today, a lot of people get mad at the Europeans saying, yeah, the Europeans, they brought in that homosexuality and all that. No, brothers and sisters. No. We're reading it right here. Sodom and Gomorrah. That was black people. Africans that were there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Right here. We're reading about uh, Benjamites. Black people. People of color. From Northeast Africa. These are people that's practicing homosexuality. In Israel. Now we ain't going to blame the whole tribe of Benjamin. Because I, I, I highly doubt that the whole tribe was gay. But we hear that these sons of Belial wanted to know him. So let's continue on. Verse 23. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brother, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is coming to mine house, do not do this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seems good unto you, but unto this man, do not so vile a thing. Either way, it's all sin. Because even this man, the man of the house, you're trying to give your daughter and the man's wife to them as well? Because a concubine is a wife. That's against the Torah as well. So we're seeing all types of error here. But I get it. He's, 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 he's desperate. And he's trying to diffuse this situation however he can. But you know, two wrongs don't make a right. So now we read in verse 25 that, but the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door at the man, uh, of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the door of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, 
was fallen down at the, at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be gone. But none answered. She didn't answer because she was dead. Then the man took her upon her ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And when he was come into the house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day consider of it take advice and speak your mind so y'all see how wicked of, of a thing this is this is in the uh, tribe of Benjamin but you know what I don't really want to read the next uh, narrative in, in, in chapter 20 because it's very long but what I will say is this is the problem in Israel today because what happens in this narrative in Judges 20 is Israel starts to go to war with the tribe of Benjamin because Benjamin don't want to give over the uh, sons of Belial to uh, be killed for what they did so that they can purge that sin out of Israel. And now the whole purpose of me making this uh, study is to bring forth the eyes and the ears on this problem that we still have today because this is what's happening in Israel with all our different camps and, um, and assemblies and churches and such. We see people, especially when it comes to the leadership, that are doing things contrary to the Bible, doing things contrary to what our master teach us and how to walk and how to deal with our brothers and sisters and deal with the Gentiles. A lot of them are contrary to the teachings of the Bible, but yet our brothers and sisters that are part of their congregations and camps and assemblies refuse to speak up to turn them over so that they can be edified and so that they can be uh, corrected in what they're doing so we can purge this out of Israel. This is what we're reading. Y'all get y'all a chance? Um, I know a lot of y'all already read this before, but refresh your mind. Read Judges chapter 20 and, 20 and 21 because because of the wickedness of Benjamin, you know, they went to war. Many men in Judah were killed. Some of the other tribes were, were killed, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, men. 14,000, 25,000. A lot of our men in Israel were killed going to battle because Benjamin would not do the right thing. And that's exactly what's going to happen in these days as well. Because a lot of y'all not turning over these people that are sinning against our brothers and sisters. And when you don't turn over and get that sent out, it's going to affect the whole congregation. So a lot of you brothers and sisters that's in these camps and assemblies, you don't want to repent. You don't want to turn over. You're going to do exactly what Yahshua said that you was going uh, that the um, Pharisees was going to do. You're going to make these um, these men and women, our, our brothers and sisters, you know, uh, what does he say? Two times the sons and uh, daughters of hell. Is that what he said? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm paraphrasing. Because if you don't turn from your wicked ways, how are you going to lead our brothers and sisters into righteousness? And that's what the uh, tribe of Benjamin did. Let's go ahead, I'm because I want to go ahead and finish this off. Let's go um, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6 says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him and one Master Yeshua HaMashiach, by whom are all things, as we by him. All right. So we are supposed to be one. Just like the father. And just like the son are one. Right. We supposed to be in him. One with Yeshua HaMashiach. And we supposed to be. Doing as he did. Because he is the example. Yeshua is the perfect example. Of a peacemaker. All right. He is the prophet. He is the ambassador. He is our priest. He is the one. That is the uh, prototype, so to speak, on how we should live. But a lot of us are reading this same Bible and still doing things contrary to the unification of Israel because of this folly and all this foolishness. 
One of the biggest uh, pieces of folly that I saw so far with the camps was when the Sakari, because we have it, we just coming off a of Passover. I'm speaking on this, and I'm not trying to ridicule these brothers, but we have to edify each other. But one of the biggest forms of folly I've seen is when they were uh, keeping the Passover at that uh, nightclub with the naked girls walking past with the bottles and sparkly bottles and and and. And, and worldly people that dance in the secular music and they had drinks in their hand and all that stuff if we can't edify people like that we are in trouble how are we going to unify with a, man, with a mind like that this is crazy brothers and sisters let's go ahead and uh, move this on and we got, got a few more after this let's go to the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to be reading verses uh, 3 to 11. 1 Timothy, uh, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 11 reads. This is a warning against false teachers. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither given heed to fables and endless genealogies as again as i um as i said earlier one of the biggest debates in israel is the debate over um jacob versus esau and who is esau he's telling you right here we're not supposed to give heed to these fables and endless gene genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edif edifying which is in faith so do that is my point here we are in the last days. We're supposed to be getting everybody prepared for Jacob's trouble, but we're still arguing over the 12 tribes chart. We're still arguing over the virgin birth. Last night, when uh, Friday night frankincense, that's what the, bro the brother asked me about the virgin birth. Like, come on, man. What does that got to do with salvation? You don't understand the virgin birth. You don't understand... Uh, you know, that Yahshua, you know, came about by the power, the mind of Yahweh, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So why am I going to continue to argue with you and you don't understand that yet? Instead, I, I choose as a minister to, you know, contend with you so your faith can be strengthened. And so that we can start to get ready for this last days. Let's go learn how to fish together or something. Now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfaith from which some have been swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm and that is a lot of them today. They are desiring to become teachers before time and again, as I said, everybody is not called to teach. Everybody is not called to um, hold the office of a teacher. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with being a teacher. The teaching part, delivering, is the easy part. Receiving revelation from the Almighty is a natural thing. But the, the hard part is keeping your heart completely sincere while your flesh is trying to pull you away from it what do i mean i wrestle with my flesh this is something that we all have to do and when you wrestle with the flesh and you let your flesh you know take over you'll read a scripture and then you'll start to have a desire to insert your own ideologies into the text on what you wanted to say we cannot do that we have to be um honest we have to be completely sincere and that's what i mean by that you know it says in verse eight but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully this is for all my christian followers sunday christian followers it tells you right here that the law is good if you use it lawfully Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man or woman, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners, 
for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. That's the, that's, that's the, tri that's the tribe of Benjamin, the ones who are uh, trying to know that uh, man. That's homosexuality. For man stealers, for liars, for perjured um, persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the, blesses El of the blessed Elohim, which was committed to my trust. See, as teachers, we are committed to preach this gospel to all of y'all with an unbiased heart to be sincere. Because a lot of times we contending with y'all. If y'all say something is right, we got to admit it. Yeah, you're right on this. But hold on. Look at this, though. We got to be honest. All right, we got uh, three more left. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to be reading verses 16 through 17. And it reads, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the commun communion of the blood of the Mashiach? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Mashiach? For we being many are one bread. Remember, the, uh, what was that, two weeks ago, when I brought out the uh, two different um, multitudes, the 5,000. 5,000 were all Hebrew Israelites, mostly of them. The 4,000, they, uh, they were Gentiles. But in that living parable, we were seeing that he had that one loaf of bread, which symbolized Yahshua as that one, uh, as that one loaf. See, we are many, but we are in one loaf of bread. And this is why we need to unify. The best way to unify is to get our hearts out of the way and stop all this contending with each other over foolish uh, um, debates and arguments And that's what a lot of us is doing Especially with my ABT uh, family We're not getting into all these stupid debates We'll contend with you But if it's that same old tired stuff We're not doing it And on my um, personal I'm not, I'm not debating with anybody That is not on my level You know this ain't no brag or boast Of any knowledge that I have But if I If I you know, discern that you're simply not on my level. You're not worth. You're not worth my time. And I see so much pseudo scholarship out there on Facebook and Instagram. A lot of time, I just keep on scrolling. But it's the ones that I see that pique my attention. So this one, brothers and sisters, y'all gotta hear this. Hold on, let me let me get my phone open real quick. I just want to know if y'all ever heard this one before. This one, this one's on my YouTube page. So let me bring it up real quick. Give me one second. All right, I'm on YouTube, and it was a brother that got on one of my older videos the other day. I ain't even going to read y'all the whole back and forth. I just want to read y'all what he said in regards to um, my um, video. The name of my video is Yahweh is not the God of Christianity. And in context, it should have read Yahweh is not the God of Sunday. Christianity. But either way, this is what he wrote. The God of the New Testament is Jesus' Father. The God of the Old Testament is not. Did y'all hear what I just said? This is the pseudo scholarship that we have to deal with on a daily. He just said that the God of the Old Testament is not Jesus' Father. He further reads, they are two different people. Okay. Yahweh lied to the prophets and the heavenly father cannot lie. Yahweh sent a lion spirit. The heavenly father doesn't tempt people, let alone tempt them with evil. Jesus is literally against the teachings of Yahweh. Eye for an eye. Two for a tooth, oaths, the snakes. Je Jesus said, if your child asks you for a fish and you give him a snake, that's evil. I'm confused why would Jesus say that when he knows Yahweh did that when the Israelites wanted food and Yahweh sent snakes that killed them. 
Yahweh sent a lion spirit to the prophets in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in James, God himself, don't tempt people, let alone tempt them with evil. He is truth. How is Yahweh the father of Jesus if, fa if the father of Jesus can't lie? So how did Yahweh send a lion spirit? If Jesus telling us clear as day that Yahweh is not the father, Yahweh said in Psalms, blessed are those who smash babies against the rocks. I'm thinking the heavenly father would not do that. Jesus never referred to the, uh, the his, he got a typo, never referred to his father as Yahweh. He said, Abba Yahweh, he said, Abba father, and the term heavenly father is used. Yahweh isn't even found in the New Testament, not in the King James or NIV. This is confusion. See, y'all see, so now y'all see the foolishness and the folly that we all as teachers got to deal with here. All right. And some of you too that aren't teachers, I know y'all contending with the faith too, but this right here, I tore them apart. I'm not going to read y'all everything I said, but one of the things that he said was it's not possible for, for uh, Yahweh to be Jesus' father because, you know, Yahweh uh, kills people and Jesus does not. And just to debunk him very, very quickly, I gave him two scriptures. Y'all can read this on your own time. Excuse me. One scripture was Isaiah 66, 15 to 17. That's a prophecy. That is an unfulfilled prophecy of Yeshua coming in the last days, um, killing people. And the second one I gave him was Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16 and verse 21, um, where Yeshua, Jesus, is going to come and kill people. All right? So, excuse me. This is the uh, foolishness that we got to deal with. You know, the thing is, when you don't have a relationship with Yahweh, it's impossible to have a relationship with Yeshua and vice versa as well. If you don't have a um, relationship with Yahshua, it's impossible for you to have a relationship with the Father. And that's basically what this gentleman is dealing with. He went back and forth with me for a few, and then he finally conceded after I hit him with these scriptures. He ran for cover. This is this is part of the problem. A lot of people are getting into this um, Bible, and they're saying things that they just simply don't understand, and that's because you're speaking prematurely before you get a a, a grasp on what the Bible is actually saying. And then also a lot of times it's just simply not for them because they just simply was not called. And I'm not even speaking called to teach. I'm speaking called into the glorious kingdom of Yahweh because it's only the father that calls you into this. Let's go to the book of Acts. Two more scriptures and then we'll be done. This is uh, the book of Acts chapter 4. Verses 23 through 32, and it reads, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. All right. There's a lot of the believers, um, uh, a lot of the Israelites and believers that's coming, um, you know, to a prayer right here. And when they heard that, they lifted up the, their voice to Elohim with one accord and said, uh, Yahweh, thou art Elohim, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against Yahweh and against his Mashiach. For of a truth against the holy child Yeshua, whom thou has anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So, you know, when Yeshua was being condemned, it was both Gentiles and Israel there. All right. And so when we are speaking of Israel being joined with Israel, we are mindful that there were Gentiles there that are not going to be joined with Israel as well. Think of the Romans that actually had the hand of actually physically killing our master. They're not going to get salvation, all right? But the ones that do turn 
and join ourselves and are united with Yisrael shall. All right. Um, it further reads, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. And now, Master, behold, their threshings and, um, excuse me, their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child, Yahshua. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of Yahweh with boldness and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul neither said any of them that art of the things which he possessed was his own but they had all things in common this is the mind that we have to have right now not yesterday right now we have to have a mind to be one to be unified you know if a brother comes to me in need from Israel I have to look at him as myself and have to help him the best I can so that we can continue on this fight this striving together this is how we all supposed to be coming together with meetings and we're supposed to be um, coming together with our minds on how we going to um, outlast this Jacob's trouble. This is how we ha are supposed to be right now. But instead, we have a lot of fighting. We have a lot of contention. We have a lot of strife. We have brothers and sisters in Israel that curse each other out. And they don't think there's nothing wrong with it. All while the devil is sitting back smiling. This is a problem. Last verse for the day. Let's go to the book of John chapter 17. This is our solution. John chapter 17 verse 11. And it reads, And now I am no more in the world. We all know that our master has ascended up into heaven as part of the gospel message. You know, he spilled his blood for us. You know, he resurrected. And he ascended up into heaven. Hallelujah. But these are in the world. And I come to thee. Holy Father. Keep through thine own name. Those whom thou has given me. That they may be one. As we are. If we are all in Yahweh. And, 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 and in a sense of this argument. I call on the name Yahweh. But if you call on Yahweh. Yahweh, Jehovah, God, the Father, whatever you call the Father, we all have to be one. Because there's a lot of brothers out there preaching that we can only be one unless we all agree on the same name. No, 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 no. That's simply not true. This is a spiritual battle. All right? He's confused the languages in this entire world. You know? If you call on him by the name Yahuwah, he hears you if your heart is sincere and you are called by his name. All right? We are supposed to be one if we are all following the same Elohim, the God of Israel. All right? Verse 12 says, excuse me, let's go down to verse 21. Verse 21 says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. See, this is how it's supposed to be. This is the formula. Just like the Father and Yahshua are one. It's like the Father is in Yahshua and Yahshua is in the Father. We are supposed to be in Yahshua. And we are supposed to be in each other. As the body of Yahshua. This is how we are supposed to be helping each other. We're supposed to be helping each other with ideas. On prepping for Jacob's trouble. I suppose to be able to go to my brother um, in the audience. My brother Hakeem. And say hey Hakeem. You know how are you with your um, your, your book bag. That you are starting to pack up your things. And get your things ready. For when the, uh, you know trouble hit. You know did you uh, make sure you got a toothbrush. In your, uh, in your um, book bag. Do you have a shovel. In your book bag. Shovel. Why would I need a shovel. Well you need a shovel. Because in the uh, Torah. 
it states that when you are out in the field in the forest, um, I can't remember the exact scripture address and exact word, but basically it alludes to you having a shovel with you for when you have to relieve yourself. All right, now if you're out in the um, in, in the um, forest, what the father is saying that you don't he don't want you to just relieve yourself and just leave it there. You take your shovel and you bury it. Now, as gross as that sounds to a lot of you, this is the kind of stuff we need to learn in these last days, right? We need to learn how to start a fire. We need to learn how to cleanse water. Let's say that you learn how to be out on off grid, out on your own, but you don't know how to clean water, right? You gather up all the rainwater, you're keeping it in your containers or whatever you're doing, but how do you clean it though? Um, is boiling water the only method? You can boil it, but then you got to wait for it to cool off and all that. And then you got to be mindful that if we are off grid, campfires and stuff like that attract attention. So this is why these conversations are so necessary, because while we're living off grid, we want to be hid from the world while we are waiting on our master. All right, let's go ahead and finish this. Uh, so verse uh, 22 says, and the glory which thou givest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Hallelujah. So in closing, brothers and sisters, this is a prelude to a series that I am about to do on a great reset on you know understanding uh, the beast system and understanding what's actually coming our way. It's been a long time I'm um, coming because I've been doing a lot of research on this topic. I still got some more research to do. I'm gonna try to cram some in this week uh, to get ready for next Shabbat. Um, next Shabbat, y'all willing, I will be back on. And that is what's gonna be on the menu. In the meantime, let us all have a mind to wanna turn to each other and have peace and shalom as we brought out in this message. That is what the Father wants. We are all his creation. And his desire is for us to dwell in peace and be of one like mind and one like body as his son and him are one. All right. And how do we become one? Is we can start uh, not arguing over the things that we disagree on. Some things are real serious and I get it. We got to contend for it. But at the end of the day, we have to use uh, discernment to say, hey, you know what? It's just simply not worth the stress. You know, I'm not going to sit here and just argue um, with you about uh, Yahweh is not Jesus father. I'm not going to have that argument with you. You know, I said what I said. It was uh, I responded two times and that's it. I don't got nothing else to say to you after that, because if you want to keep going on and on and on, obviously you're not interested in edification. You are just looking for a fight. So with that said, brothers and sisters. Let's give all praise and honor to the almighty Yahweh, Elohim of the heavens and the earth, in the name of his only begotten son, Yeshua HaMashiach, the light of the world, and our soon coming king, redeemer, and deliverer. Hallelujah. Yah willing, you two family, we see y'all all again next week. Shalom, shalom, shalom.